This is Christopher Nolan, a British-American filmmaker best known for the movies Inception, The Dark Knight, Interstellar, and Oppenheimer. Over the years, the man has built himself into a bit of a household name. But while Christopher Nolan was making movies and collecting accolades, another Nolan was on the run from the Costa Rican government. And that's because they insist that Christopher Nolan's brother is an international hitman. Now I should probably clarify that I'm not talking about Jonathan Nolan, Christopher's younger brother who was also a filmmaker, although you could argue he should be convicted for murdering Westworld's storyline in season 3. But no, this is Christopher's older brother Matthew that we're talking about. You can see all three of the brothers here, attending Matthew's wedding. And even though they look like the villains in the first Purge movie, only one of them is actually a criminal. If you go on Christopher Nolan's Wikipedia page, this is the only mention that Matthew gets which would lead most people to believe that he's just another unknown celebrity sibling like Larry Hanks, Nancy Spielberg, or Ezekiel Winfrey. I made one of those up, but it doesn't really matter because nobody ever thinks about celebrity siblings. And perhaps Matthew Nolan used that very fact to his advantage when he committed multiple crimes in Central America. The story begins with Robert Bresca, a millionaire gem dealer based in South Florida. This is the only picture I could find of the guy, so please excuse the fact that it's a two-pixel image of him and his wife at a country ball. In the 70s and 80s, Bresco was involved in a Milwaukee cocaine ring, working with the Mafia boss Anthony J. Peters. Bresco would launder the Mafia's drug money by lying about the value of gems, but he testified against the other members of the ring and received a reduced prison sentence of three years. So that should give you some idea of the kind of person he is. After his prison time, he went right back into the gem business, where he seems to have thrived. But around 2004, Bresca became convinced that his accountant Robert Cohen had stolen around $7 million from him. When the accusation was made, Robert Cohen said that the money was actually lost by his Costa Rican business partner Mario Quintana, who had been helping Cohen invest Bresca's money into shell companies in Costa Rica. Shortly thereafter, Mario Quintana was found dead of an apparent suicide and there's absolutely nothing suspicious about that. So when the guy he had just blamed for stealing money from a shady gem dealer was found dead, Robert Cohen understandably began fearing for his life. In a letter to his attorney two weeks later, Cohen said that Bresca is capable of putting my life in danger, and if that wasn't an ominous enough comment, also said, if anything were to happen to me, Mr. Bresca would be the person responsible. Doesn't really get more damning than that. But Robert Bresca was not the kind of man to get his hands dirty except maybe with his wife after a good country ball. So he turned to Matthew Nolan, who the Costa Rican government claims was working as a hitman. But I guess he wasn't a good enough hitman to get the job done in the United States, so Bresca and Nolan devised a plan to lure Cohen to Costa Rica. In February of 2005, Bresca introduced Nolan to Cohen, pretending that Nolan was a millionaire diamond dealer who would be working with them. To make things even weirder, the fake name that they gave Matthew Nolan was Matthew McCall Oppenheimer. But no, this was not some weird foreshadowing to his younger brother's eventual film. They gave him that name to pretend he was from the wealthy Oppenheimer family that controlled the De Beers Diamond Consortium for 80 years. But let's not let the absurdity of the Oppenheimer part distract us from the fact that they kept the same first name in Matthew Nolan's alias. Couldn't even be bothered to go by Matt for a little bit. Anyways, after Cohen met Nolan in the United States, Bresca convinced him to fly to Costa Rica to conduct business with Nolan. Before Cohen came to town, Nolan got there first to scope out the area. He stayed at the Arola Holiday Inn Hotel in San Jose, the capital of Costa Rica. There he met Luis Alonso Douglas Mejia, a bellboy at the hotel who became Nolan's right-hand man for the job. Nolan also rented a white Toyota 4Runner, authorizing Mejia as a driver in the rental contract. This will all be important later, I'm not just telling you about his taste in mid-sized SUVs. Robert Cohen arrived in Costa Rica on March 2nd, at which point he met up with Matthew Nolan and the two of them checked in to the Real Intercontinental Hotel in another part of San Jose. Over the next few days, Nolan and Cohen became good friends, staying in adjacent rooms and hanging out with one of Cohen's attorneys. Apparently, they even went to see Andrea Bocelli, the legendary Italian tenor, live in concert on March 5th, although the official court documents call him Andrew Bocelli, so maybe they were seeing his American cousin. The morning after the Bocelli concert, Matthew Nolan threw away those four days of friendship and got to work. Over the course of the trip, he had figured out that Cohen liked to start each day with a walk around the Multiplaza shopping center across the street from the hotel. So on the morning of March 6th, Nolan joined Cohen on his daily walk after the two of them had breakfast together. 
During the walk, Luis Mejia allegedly pulled up next to them in the Toyota 4Runner, at which point Nolan and Mejia pulled Cohen into the car and drove away. A few hours later, Nolan returned to the hotel and retrieved some documents from Cohen's room. He then told Cohen's attorney and their other colleague that his pregnant wife was sick and he needed to fly to Paris immediately, so he booked an emergency flight to Paris and fled the country. To Nolan's credit, his wife really was sick, as medical records later revealed. But she was in Chicago, so I don't know why her husband had to go to Paris unless she had a prescription for a fresh croissant. Meanwhile, Mejia was holding Cohen captive somewhere in the Limon province of Costa Rica. Nolan returned to the country only three days later. I guess his wife told him to get back to what keeps the food on the table, killing people for money. And that's exactly what he did, meeting up with Mejia in the house where Cohen was being held. There, Nolan and Mejia allegedly tortured Cohen in an effort to find out what had happened to the money. All that torture resulted in a massive hemorrhage that killed Cohen. On March 10th, Cohen's body was found on a banana plantation in an area called Matina. Four days later, the police located the forerunner, still being driven by Mejia. Apparently, he had turned the rented vehicle that they used to kidnap a man into his daily driver, racking up two driving tickets in nine days. When the vehicle was returned, the rental company found cell phone batteries and a roll of gray adhesive tape in the car. Really feels like something the police should have found, but I guess they were too excited trying to collect the fees on those driving tickets. Mejia was promptly arrested, but Matthew Nolan was long gone and back to supporting his pregnant wife. According to the courts, he also continued his efforts to find Bresca's money. That's the Nolan family work ethic that makes Matthew's brother such a prolific filmmaker. Over the next two years, Costa Rican authorities investigated the murder while Matthew was busy committing bank fraud in the U.S. In May of 2007, they sentenced Luis Mejia to 27 years in prison. But Costa Rica still wanted Matthew, so they requested some help from the FBI. A Chicago-based FBI agent named Pablo Araya was put on the case. When he received a U.S. arrest warrant for Matthew, he began surveillance of his house in Chicago. Apparently, Araya takes pleasure in the psychological game of finding someone, saying that any idiot can kick down a door. And perhaps that desire to challenge himself is why it took him almost two years to finally arrest Matthew Nolan. It seems Matthew had a feeling he was wanted by the FBI and was successfully dodging Araya at every turn. But their elaborate cat and mouse game finally came to an end in early 2009, when Matthew and his wife filed for bankruptcy. I guess the kidnapping and torture business just wasn't paying the bills anymore. Matthew Nolan had to attend a bankruptcy hearing in downtown Chicago, which is where Agent Araya finally arrested him on February 26, 2009. Way to kick a man when he's down, Pablo. Araya was quoted saying, I grabbed him after he had eluded me for one or two years, and when I arrested him, his words to me were, you never would have got me if it wasn't for the bankruptcy. But it was his greed that got him, because of his bankruptcy. Because we all know greedy people are famous for attending their own bankruptcy hearings. Araya also called Matthew the most arrogant person I have talked to, but considering Matthew did manage to evade the FBI for two years, I feel like he deserves to brag a little bit. Once Matthew was under arrest, the Costa Rican authorities began their case for why he should be extradited to Costa Rica. While the case was being prepared, Nolan was held at Chicago's Metropolitan Correctional Center. And this is where the story somehow gets even weirder. While he was being held in the correctional center, it was discovered that Matthew Nolan was planning an elaborate prison escape. The guards searched his cell and found 31 feet of ropes made from bedding, a makeshift harness, a handcuff key made out of a pen cap, and a razor blade hidden in a bar of soap. You really have to respect Matthew Nolan's dedication to living like he's the main character in an action thriller. When the extradition case finally happened, Nolan's attorney pointed out some flaws in the Costa Rican government's evidence. So somehow, against all odds, the judge ruled that there wasn't enough evidence to extradite Nolan to Costa Rica for the kidnapping and murder charges. I guess they thought that him using a fake name, renting the car Cohen was kidnapped in, and being with the guy when he was kidnapped wasn't quite the smoking gun they were looking for. It's also a mystery how Nolan afforded his lawyer, with Araya saying, I do not know how he paid for his defense. He was going through bankruptcy. Someone paid for a high-powered attorney. It might be wise to look at the millionaire gem dealer who had hired Nolan for the job in the first place, but who am I to say? Still, Matthew Nolan was not completely free. The judge did approve the extradition request regarding a fake passport charge, which comes with a maximum prison sentence of six years, meaning Costa Rica could still get some kind of justice. But in perhaps the most baffling part of the whole thing, Costa Rica ultimately abandoned their request to extradite him on that charge. 
A spokesperson for the country's public ministry said they dropped the charge because it was secondary to the other charges. Which honestly makes absolutely no sense at all. In the end, Matthew Nolan did spend a little time in U.S. prison for planning that escape, but he was released in 2010 and has been a free man ever since. And just to add to the absurdity of the whole thing, in 2012, Matthew actually filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government for the physical, psychological, and psychiatric injury that he had endured while in prison. I have a feeling that one could have probably been a class action. As far as the more successful Nolan brothers, they've never commented on Matthew and reportedly had no idea he was committing crimes in Central America. But they wouldn't admit to that if they did, so it doesn't really mean much. That information comes from an article in the Times called Batman, Robin, and Murder. Very nice, very nice. Thank you to reporter Chris Goodwin for that one. Today, Matthew Nolan lives a quiet life in Chicago with his wife and kids. Robert Bresca is also a free man and still lives in Florida, although he and his wife seem to have gotten a divorce. I guess he attends those country balls alone now. So in the end, almost no justice was delivered but at least Christopher Nolan was able to make this story a little harder to Google with the name of his latest film. Now please consider subscribing or I'll hire Larry Hanks to murder you.